Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together and hear and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest and made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against you in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are in the room, to the saints that couldn't make it, to the saints watching in on the camera, the saints that are scattered around the world that we don't even know about. No peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. We got one more book left of the Old Testament, the so-called Old Testament. Nehemiah. Let's jump right into it. It's Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. So last week we read Malachi. Malachi was the last prophet book that we have in chronological order. He actually the last prophet book in the uh the way in the order of the book too but in chronological order he's the last prophetic book that we got um and so we learned a lot from nehemiah he talked to us a little bit about you know what i'm saying the faults of the people he talked to us a lot about the priests and then and then he got on us about you know how we treat our first wife right our youngest wife or the wife of our youth rather is how he put it and uh he also told us gave us some prophecy about what is to come when he told us about elijah how Elijah was going to make a way and how Elijah uh, was uh, was going to come and turn the hearts of the children back to the fathers and the hearts of the father back to the children. We talked about, you know, what that could possibly mean and some of the prophecy that that tied to. Uh, so now we're going to jump into Nehemiah and we're going to learn a little bit of how Nehemiah. So let's a little bit of how Nehemiah uh, uh, helped set up the city. So let's kind of recap just a little bit. We know. Right that Ezra came onto the scene first, right? Remember Daniel? Daniel was praying like, man, we got to get back in it. We got to get back, you know what I'm saying? Most high God, you got to look after us. I know we sinned, right? Remember he is praying. Then after that, Ezra, well, uh, in the book of Ezra, rather, you know what I'm saying? In the, uh, in the book of Ezra, we learned about how um, Zerubbabel and, and uh, Joshua both came back to our land, right? Joshua being the high priest. And so many of the priests helped build the, the tabernacle again, right? So we learned about how they started to put the tabernacle together. They laid the foundation. And after that, the people, you know what I'm saying? The people, the, the strangers, you know what I'm saying? The people that was there in Israel, uh, the Gentiles, they came down and they looked at us and they was like, yo, we, you know what I'm saying? We should help. So remember, the 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 northern tribes they sent a priest to teach them about our God, but you remember they teach them about a defiled version of our God, right? They didn't teach them our laws, our statutes, our commandments that came from Moses. They start teaching them, you know, what I'm saying all their traditions and the stuff that they kept because the northern tribes always went astray. So when that happened, the people thought that they served the same God as us. So they looking at us, kind of laid a foundation. And they, we coming back to the land. Remember, we had gone from the land 70 years, right? So we coming back to the land. The Gentiles look at us. The Gentiles like, yeah, you know what I'm saying? Let us, you know what I'm saying? Let us help you out with building that. So we read in the book of Ezra how we told them, nah, yeah, I ain't got nothing to do with this. We went down with letting them, let, I mean, we wouldn't even let, remember, we was checking people at the door. If people came back to the land with us and they couldn't tell us who their daddy was and tell us how they tied back to one of the tribes, we wasn't even letting them go. And it was a lot of priests in the business, right? So mostly it was priests. All these other people can't do it. No strangers allowed. Y'all can't touch the work. Why wouldn't they be able to touch the um, touch the tabernacle? Right? They wouldn't have. Our priests wouldn't have wanted just anybody touching the tabernacle. That don't make sense. We might just defile this thing while we putting it up. That's not appropriate, right? So they said, nope, we're not going to do that. That's not happening. Y'all can't have it. The Gentiles got mad, if you remember, and they went to the king, right? After they went to the king, they let the king know, and the king was like, yo, 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 you right. This is a reckless people. These people are rebellious. He called them, uh, what they call the Trump people? What they call the people that ran up in the Capitol? Insurrection. 
Interact. Yeah, he said this is an insurrectionist people. Right? He said this is an insurrectionist people. You write, tell them stop building and don't start building again until I give them the okay. Right? So then the king shut it down. So we had to stop our people sad. We like, man, these people always messing with us. And then fast forward, that king dies. Another king, or I'm not going to say he died, but another king took over after that king. And then we start building again. We ain't asked nobody permission. You know what I'm saying? We just start building again. But the most high God gave us the authorization to build. He, gave, he sent the prophets. You remember, he sent two prophets to us, Haggai, right? And Zechariah. And those two prophets told us, go ahead and start building. So at that point, that's exactly what we did. Then the Gentile came back again, and they was like, oh, y'all building. Who gave y'all authority to build? So they went back to the king, to the new king, and they're like, yo, 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 these people building. Why don't you check the records on them? This king was a little different. He checked the records, and he was like, oh, y'all crazy. Let them build. Not only let them build, I'm going to supply everything they need to build. So through that process, we ended up building the second version of the temple. So remember, the first temple was built by King Solomon, right? By the designs of David that he got from the Most High God. The next temple, this was built by um, by uh, by the by the prophecy of uh, Zerubbabel. I mean, I'm sorry, the prophecy of uh, Zechariah and Haggai and uh, led by Zerubbabel and uh, Joshua, right? Joshua being the high priest, right? So now after the land is kind of, kind of coming back together a little bit. Remember, not all of our people are there. It's mostly just Levites and priests that's there now, right? There's some other people there, but it's mostly just Levites and priests. So we're going to read about Nehemiah and how Nehemiah is kind of coming with the next groups that kind of brings a lot more people, right? It brings a lot more people into the mix. So this is Nehemiah chapter one, verse one. Let's see what the book says. You on mute? Hello? Are you reading or are you on mute? My bad, I'm on mute. <laughs> I was on a roll. It's Nehemiah chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass. In Sound the better of when you was on mute. In the month of Shizlu. In the 20th year, as I was in Shushan, the palace, the Han and I, one of my brothers, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in a province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also was broken down. The gates thereof are burnt with fire. And it came to pass, when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned right? seven days. So now look, Nehemiah, he asked about, he was like, man, I heard some of our people went back home. That's pretty much what he asked, right? He said, I heard some of our people went back home. They're like, yeah. He's like, all right, so how they doing out there? You know what I'm saying? Because he's not back home yet. So he looked like, man, how they doing out there? How the people doing out there? The man told you, he's like, man, I was, I was just out there, bro. I ain't going to lie to you. They out there doing bad, bro. It look rough out there. The walls burnt down. Everything tore up. Man, at any time, anybody can come. You got you to gotta put yourself in our ancestors' shoes. We was living lively. We got a rich history. All our stuff is documented, how, how we live in our nation, in our land. But you know what also is in our history? How multiple times we got attacked. Literally from the times of judges, right? You had the, the people of Ammon attacking us, the Moabites attacking us, the Philistines attacking us. Right. Constantly we being attacked. We got kings that pop up and then we being attacked by Syria. We being attacked by Edom. We being attacked every direction. These people always trying to attack us. So one of the things that multiple of our kings did is they built walls to protect us from being attacked. So we had these elaborate walls. But then guess what? The king of Babylon came. He, he, he broke down all of our walls, took us captive. And that's how they got into the position that they're in now. So right now, the biggest thing for us is security, right? It's like, it's like, how I'm going to go home? How my people at home and they sitting around, they ain't got no security. We just got into trouble with this stuff, right? They just burned down my, our walls. 
if we're going to go back to our land, the first thing we got to do is learn how to protect ourselves. Right? So he looking at it, he looking like, dang, man. It feels insecure. It feels like at any moment all this can be taken away again. Right? So let's see. It made him sad when he hear that. Let's see what he said. And mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before God, the God of heaven, and said, I beseech thee, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive and thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night. For the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess. Pay to the prayer. Him. Remember, we talk about the, the components of a prayer. He identified Yah, right? He gonna end up giving glory, right? He gonna, he gonna, uh, uh, what else is there? Oh, he gonna confess, and then he gonna make his request, right? Those are the four components that we often see uh, with the men of God in the book. Watch this. And confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee. Both I and my father's house have sinned. We mm -hmm. have dealt very corruptly against thee and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments, which thou hast commanded thy servant Moses. Mm -hmm. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if you turn to me and keep my commandments and do them, Though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of heaven, yet will I gather from them, from thence, yet will I gather from thence, and will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Mm -hmm. Now these are thy servants and thy people, whom thou hast redeemed by thy great power and by thy strong hand. O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, and to the prayer of thy servants, who desire to fear thy name. And prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. All right. So he's he's basically saying, look, give me mercy in front of the king. You know what I'm saying? Because I work for the king. You know what I'm saying? And look out for your people. Cause it's rough out here in these streets. Don't forget about us. We know we messed up, right? So watch this. Watch what happened next. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king, that, uh, that wine was before him. And I took up the wine and gave it unto the king. Now I right, so he's the cupbearer. In other words, he be bringing in the cups for the king. He serves the king, right? So now the king thirsty. He look like, man, bring me something to drink, boy, right? And he bring it over to the king. Watch this. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing you are not sick? This is right. So Nehemiah, the way Nehemiah is, Nehemiah don't be walking around moping. Usually when it's time to get to work, he put a smile on his face. Good customer service. You know what I'm saying? Got a smile on his face. You know what I'm saying? When I was in customer service on the phone, they used to tell me, you have to, you have to, you have to talk on the phone with a smile. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? They used to tell you, even though they can't see your smile, they can hear it. You know what I'm saying? So I used to be sitting there like, uh, ah, thank you for calling Helio. You know what I'm saying? Trying to this is this is this is philip how can i help you today with this fake smile on my face i feel like they couldn't darn hear my stuff right so that's how nehemiah was nehemiah said i'm gonna handle this with a smile so the king ain't seen the king's never seen him sad he always when nehemiah go to work he always got his stuff together he always makes sure you know what if i'm working i ain't about to be distraught i'm gonna keep a good attitude i'm gonna get my job done i'm gonna do this i'm gonna go home i'm gonna keep it moving right Nehemiah type of man, look, I'm a, you know, some people, like when I go to work, I leave home at home. And when I go home, I leave work at work. You know what I'm saying? Like Nehemiah was that type. You know what I'm saying? Take it in there. Hey, how's it going? Here's your cup. Thank you a lot. All right, I'm out of here. And then probably stress out out there. Like, okay, whoo, I'm finally off. But today, Nehemiah was a little different, right? Nehemiah, he is sitting there. He said, I'm not feeling it today. You know what I'm saying? A little sad about my people. Right. And the king noticed it. Watch what the king said. Wherefore, the king said unto me, why is thy countenance sad, seeing you are not sick? This is this is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then was I very sore afraid and said unto the king, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad when the city, the place of my father's sepulchers, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, 
for what does thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and, it, and I said unto the king, if it please the king, and if thy servant has found favor in thy sight, that you would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres, that I may build it. And the king said unto me, the queen also sitting by him, for how long shall the journey be? And when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me, and I sent him a time. Moreover, I said unto the king, if it please the king, let letters be given to me to the governors beyond the river, that they may convey me over till I come to Judah. And the letter unto Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the, for the gates of the palace, which, uh, which appertain to the house, and for the wall of the city, and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. Right. So so what he did just now is he asked the king for material. He like, man, look, give me some letters and make sure I'm good out there. And also, you know, what I'm saying if possible, if you can give me the stuff to help build up my city, that'd be good. So he gave him a whole bunch of wood, a bunch of lumber. You know what I'm saying? So he kind of wrote him a note like, yeah, just talk to this person. He's going to give you everything you need. They're going to supply the orders. They just tell them to build me. You know what I'm saying? So the king could basically tell him, I'm going to pay for this. That's what he asked him for, at least. Watch this. Then I came to the governors beyond the river and gave them the king's letters. Now the king had sent captains of the army and horsemen with me. When Sambalat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, the servant, the Ammonite heard of it. It grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So I came to Jerusalem and was there three days. Now I rose in the night and I, I and some few men with me, neither told I any man what my God had put in my heart to do at Jerusalem. Neither was there any beast with me except the beast that I had rode upon. And I went out by night by the gate of the valley, even before the dragon well, into the dung port and viewed the walls of Jerusalem, which were broken down, and the gates thereof were consumed with fire. Then I went on to the gate of the fountain, and to the king's pool, but there was no place for the beast that was under me to pass. Then went I up by night, up in the night by the brook, and viewed the wall, and turned back and entered by the gate of the valley, and so returned. And the rulers knew not where I went, or what I did, neither had I as yet told it to the Jews, nor the priests, nor the nobles, nor the rulers, nor the rest that did the work. Then said right, I, so, so at this point, he just scoping out the land, but he's telling you, don't nobody know what I'm doing. Right. He said, I didn't, I'm not asking nobody for permission about nothing. He just riding around on the city, kind of, kind of just scoping it out, looking at it like, OK, it's the condition that we in. He talking about like some parts I try to go. I can't even pass over on my donkey because my donkey will mess around and fall over. It ain't nothing for him to pass over. Right. So he said, then I rode around again at night and I'm taking a look at what's going on. And he's just looking at like the condition of the land and how everything is and how everything's set up. And so at this point, he's just scoping it out. Like what, where do we need to start? What do we need to do? Right. Keep going. Then said I to them, you see the distress. You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lieth waste, and the gates thereof are burnt with fire. Come and let mm -hmm. us build up the wall of Jerusalem, that we be no more a reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which, uh, which was good upon me, as also the king's words that had spoken unto me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands to do the, for, for this good work. But when Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the servant, the Ammonite, and Gershom, the Arabian heard, it, they laughed us to scorn and despised us and said, what is this thing that you do? Will you rebel against the king? Then answered I to them and said unto them, the God of heaven, he will prosper us. Therefore, we, his servants, will rise and build. But you have no portion, nor right, nor memorial in Jerusalem. All right. So they start laughing. And the Gentiles are looking at it like, what y'all going to do? Y'all there? But y'all going to rebel against the king? Now, it's is. It probably mean two things, right? It mean probably two things. One, he probably thought, they probably thought that the king was telling them they couldn't build a wall, right? That's probably the first thing it means. But on the other side, I think it also probably is trying to say, oh, you know how y'all get, y'all get rebellious to the different kings. If somebody rule over Israel, y'all always get rebellious. So what you trying to build a wall to protect yourself from when you get rebellious? This is why they keep come taking y'all out, right? So they looking at it and they just kind of hating on our whole situation. 
because Nehemiah, he haven't told nobody what the plans was. He just riding around on the city. And then they asked him, like, what you what you doing? And Nehemiah was like, man, it look a mess out here. We're going to rebuild this wall. Then he told him what the king said. Like, yeah, the king, you know what I'm saying? He gave me everything I need, the wood, all that. We're going to take care of this. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got the resources. We're going to do it. What was the book said? Then Eliashib, the high priest, rose up with his brother and the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it, even unto the tower of Me. They sanctified it unto the tower of Hananiel. And next so now they started to rebuild stuff. So they rebuilt the sheep gate. What else? And next to him builded the men of Jericho, and next to them builded Zakur, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Asenah build, who also laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next right? to them. So now it's giving you this person is working on this part, and next to him, this person is working on this part, and next to him. So he just it this whole chapter is chapter three, right? Or yep. two. Three. So yeah, all of chapter three just give you a line of people working on the gates. On the on the, it's really is it's, it's the gates, but it's working on the wall, right? So they building a the wall, and each person is working on their own section but they got a gate on it. And it said next to him is doing this, but next to him is doing that. So they spread out and they all working together to build this stuff based off of the material that the king gave uh gave Nehemiah, right? So jump over into chapter four. We are gonna come back to three, but jump over jump over into chapter four. But it came to pass that when Sambalot heard that he that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren in the army of Samaria and said, What do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end of in a day? Will they will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burnt? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build. If a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Right. So you see, they hating on us. They look like, man, yeah, even if they do build something, they look at first, they look like, what they doing? You know what I'm saying? What these boys doing? Then the other one who's looking at it like, man, please, it don't matter what they build. A fox can run up that thing and knock the whole wall over. That thing weak. You know what I'm saying? They talking about our stuff, making fun of us. Right? Says the Pam, no, I don't, uh, no, they wasn't all, they wasn't all priests. They weren't priests that was building the wall. Right? The wall is being built outside so like they already put together the temple so now we building a wall around the whole city you know what i'm saying so they trying to build some protection for the whole city so it wasn't the priest that was doing this it's just uh just a mixture of all the people in the land <clears throat> but they making fun of our wall and what we putting together right it ain't built with the, the the luxury that we had with uh with king solomon or i think josiah put together a wall too maybe it was hezekiah you know what I'm saying? But it ain't built with that type of luxury that we that our kings in the past did. Right? So they kind of looking at it like, man, please, that weak thing. I can go over there and push that thing. If a fox run up that thing, that thing gonna fall apart. All right? Keep going. Watch this. Hear, O oh our God, for we are despised and turn their reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. And cover so not notice, their iniquity. So you notice this is the prayer of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah heard them say that, Nehemiah wasn't walking around saying, oh, forgive them, Yahuwah, for they know not what they do. You know what I'm saying? You know how Yahushua said it on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, uh, on the cross, right? When Yahushua was on the cross, he was like, forgive them. He said that. He like, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And so in the Christian mind, we get that like, okay, this is what we got to do in all situations, even though I want to say, you know what? I want you to die for doing that to me. I'm going to say, forgive them, Yahuwah. Or they ain't going to say you, but they're going to say, forgive them, Jesus. But they know not what they do. Right? But notice, that's not Nehemiah's mindset. Nehemiah said, they making, all they did is made fun. They shot some jokes at us. You know what I'm saying? All they did, shot some jokes. Nehemiah said, man, we a reproach out here. In other words, they, make, they making a mockery of us. They making fun of us out here. Turn they mockery on their own head. And send them into captivity, God. That was his prayer. His prayer was to send these boys in. He didn't go out and try to fight nobody. He didn't put no hands on them. And trust me, Nehemiah was with, he, he was with that. You know what I'm saying? Like, we're going to learn later. Nehemiah can get down if he wanted to, right? But 
He did tell them, Yahuwah, send them into captivity. That was his mindset to do that, right? Because that's how he felt. He prayed how he felt in that moment. Keep going. Watch this. Uh oh. Will we leave? Will we lose T? Whatever. Provoke thee to anger before the builders. You got to start all over. We lost you for a second. Okay. And cover not their iniquity and let not their sin be blotted out from before thee, for they have provoked thee to anger before the builders. So built we the wall, and the wall was joined together unto the hall thereof, and to the half thereof, for the people had mind to work. But it came to pass that when Sambalot and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the wall of Jerusalem were made up, and that the breaches began to be the breaches began to be stopped, then they were very wroth, and conspired all of them together to come and to fight against Jerusalem and to hinder it. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And right. So these the, our enemies, the the Gentiles around the nations, they was hating on us. Then we actually finished the wall. Right. We got it together, kind of connected it at least. Right. We connected the wall. So at that point, they start, you know, whispering like, man, I, we should fight against them. And we heard about those whispers. So we looking like, man, they about to come and fight against us. How do you think we felt? We just got we just got taken out of our land. Guess who helped us get out of our land? Who helped uh, Babylon take us out of our land? The Ammonites, the Syrians, the Edomites. Right. And now the Ammonites, the Ammonites is part of this group right now that's whispering about coming to fight us. So you got to imagine our people kind of scared. Like we looking like, man, we can't go through this again. We not about to have these people keep messing with us. We just want to live in peace. We just trying to build a wall. We just trying to get straight. Right. We don't have money like we used to. We're not a great nation. We don't have nothing. We, you know what I'm saying? Like we under the king's thumb. We can't do nothing. You know what I'm saying? We just, we relying on the king really. Remember the king, and we read about in Ezra, the king is the one that supply all of our stuff for our sacrifices. He supply all of the stuff to build the temple. So everything that we got, we relying on the king. To build this wall, we relying on the king's resources to build the wall right now. Everything we got, we relying on the king. So we don't have a lot of leverage. We don't have a lot of power. We don't have no great army like we used to have. We depleted. We, we don't got it like we used to. But at the same time, we back in our land, finally. Right? Finally back in the land. I don't want to get kicked out of this land again. Not by the likes of these guys. They going to be the ones that take me out? Man, come on. So this is what Nehemiah did. Because Nehemiah ain't scary. Nevertheless, we made our prayer unto our God and set a watch against them day and night because of them. And Judah right? said... A watch against them, what that mean? A uh, watchtower. Like somebody like staying up watch for the fight. Yeah, the right? A watch, a watch just means somebody at all times, somebody keeping an eye out. You're kind of looking like, okay, now we good, we good, now everything good. So even at night, it would be somebody that stays up overnight to keep watch, right? And then somebody in the daytime keeping watch. So at all times, you got different people that's assigned to keep watch at different time periods of the day. Watch this. And Judah said, the strength of the bearers uh, of builders is decayed. And there is much rubbish so that we are not able to build the wall. And our adversary said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come into the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower places behind the wall. And on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, their spears and their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and the rulers and to the, and to the rest of the people, be ye not afraid of them. Remember Yahuwah, which is great and terrible and fight for your brethren, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your houses. It came to pass when our enemies heard hey, that. So he had to hype life. the people up. He like, man, don't be scared of these fools. You know what I'm saying? Where your sword at? You got a sword, boy? Here, take your sword. And you, take your spear. Let's keep building. Let's keep getting this thing together. And if they come around here, fight for your people. Fight for your sister. Fight for your brother. Fight for your kids. So he hyping the people up. Like, he letting them know, like, no, we got this. We ain't scared of these boys. So the people, watch what they do. It came to pass when our enemies heard that it was known unto us, 
and God had brought their counsel to nothing, that we returned all of us to the wall, every one unto his work. And it came to pass from that time forth that the half of the half of my servants brought in the work, and the other half of them held both the spears and the shields and the bows and the and the Hebergeons and the rulers were behind all the house of Judah. They right, so so half they they split the crew in half. So now instead of everybody working on the wall, now we took turns. You work, and I'm gonna stay in guard, right? I'm gonna stay in guard with my with my sword or with my spear or whatever I got. I'm gonna stay in guard with that while you work. So if somebody come over here tripping, the half that they got the weapons, we gonna fight. You know what I'm saying? That'll buy y'all some time to get down from the wall, and then we can, you, you know, we all gonna fight. But nobody gonna catch us off guard, right? So that's what Nehemiah put together. Watch this. That's right. Stay ready so you ain't gotta get ready. For the builders, everyone had a sword girded by his side, and so build it. And he that sounded the trumpet was by me. And I said unto the nobles, and to the rulers, and to the rest of the people, the work is great and large, and we are separate wall one far from another in what place therefore ye hear the sound of the trumpet resort ye hither unto us our god shall fight for us right so, so he said listen somebody blow that trumpet now pay attention to where it came from go wherever you hear that trumpet because that's where the fight is he's like but the most high god is gonna fight for us don't y'all be scared keep going and what oh wait so I labored in the work, and half of them held the spears from the rising of the morning till the stars appeared. Likewise, at the same time, said I unto the people, let everyone with his servant lodge with Jerusalem, that in the night they might be a guard to us and labor on the day. So neither I nor my brother nor my servants nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saving that everyone put them off for washing. So in other words, they only took off their clothes. So in other words, they wasn't resting. You know what I'm saying? They was always trying to be ready, right? They was always trying to make sure they ready for the war. So they're saying the only time that we took our clothes off is when we had to wash, right? Because we didn't want nobody to catch us slipping. Got to add my little shoes on. Got to make sure, you know what I'm saying? If it come down to it, I can hit it. I can stand tough. You know what I'm saying? I can get my sword. So we is ready no matter what happens. Keep going. And there was a great cry of the people and of their wives against the brethren, the Jews. For there were that said, we are sons and our daughters are many. Therefore, we take up corn for them that we may eat and live. Some also there were that said, we have mortgaged our lands, vineyards and houses that we might buy corn because of the dearth. There was also them that said, we have borrowed money for the king's tribute and that upon our lands and vineyards. Yet now our flesh is as the flesh of our brethren and our children as their children. And lo, we bring into bondage our sons and our daughters to be servants. And some of our daughters are brought into bondage already. Neither is it in our power to redeem them. For an all right. So what they're describing is they're going into debt. That's what they're saying. They like, man, we tried. We had to we had to like sell. We had to like take a loan out on our house just so we can buy some food. They doing bad. Right. And they looking like. Look, everybody got to pay tribute by the taxes, right? So everybody got to pay taxes to the king. And I had to take out a loan. I had to borrow money just to pay taxes, right? And so at this point, Nehemiah listening to this, he looking like, dang. So who loaned y'all this money? Watch this. For other men have our lands and vineyards. And I was very angry when I heard their cry in these words. Then I consulted mm -hmm. with myself and I rebuked the nobles and the rulers and said unto them, you exact usury, every one of his brother. And I said, he said, you exact. He said, y'all the ones loaning this money. You exact usury, every one to his brother. Watch this. And I said unto them, we, after our ability, have redeemed our brother and the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will you even sell your brothers? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held they their peace and found nothing to answer. Also, I right, that was against our law. That's why Nehemiah was upset at this. It's against our law, right? For those of us that's reading the Bible in a year, we just read this, right? Grab a uh, grab a uh, Exodus for me. Exodus chapter uh, Exodus chapter twenty-two. Give me uh, give me verse like sixteen. 
This Exodus chapter 22, give me like verse 16, maybe 17. This Exodus chapter 22, give me verse 17. All right, when the book say usury, that's talking about, think of it like interest. It's kind of like interest. It's basically saying, it's saying, I'm going to loan you $5, but for that $5, I'm also going to charge you another $5, right? So I'm, I'm loaning you $5, but at the end of the day, you got to pay me $10, right? Same thing as interest, right? When it's like, when it's like okay, well, here goes a loan of $10,000, but you got to pay me x percent a year on that ten thousand so you got to pay me ten percent a year on that ten thousand dollars so then you take ten percent of that ten thousand dollars which is a thousand dollars right and then you're gonna break that thousand dollars up into 12 month payments and then that becomes what you have to pay in addition to that ten thousand dollars until it's paid off right that's that's a form of usury we call it interest right but it's a it's a form of usury so it was against our law for it, we're gonna read it. This is uh this is Exodus chapter 22, verse uh 17, maybe. You on mute again or what? No, I'm uh looking for what you're looking for. It's not 17, it's uh what's 17 say? It's talking about uh if someone entice a maid that is not betrothed and lie with her. If her father oh, utterly refused, yeah. Uh, it's after that. Go to 22, maybe? 21? Hmm. Is it 22, 21? Yeah, chapter 22, verse 21. You shall neither vex a stranger nor oppress him, for you are strangers in the land of Egypt. Yeah, it should be right there. Keep going. You shall not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you afflict them in any wise and they cry out, all, cry out at all to me, I will surely hear their cry. And my wrath mm -hmm. will wax hot and I will kill you with the sword and your wives shall be widows and your children fatherless. Uh -huh. if, you will, if you lend money to any of my people that is... Look, poor, he said, if you lend money to any of what? My people. Right? When he poor, say any of my people, that means Hebrew. That means Israelites. That means people that keep the law, statutes, and the commandments, right? So when we get into the land and Nehemiah is seeing these people and they begging, these are Israelites in our land. So he's like, oh, man, y'all all right? They coming to him like, look, man, we doing bad. We in debt. You know what I'm saying? I had to mortgage my house just to buy corn. To buy, imagine having to mortgage your house just to buy food, right? He looking like, look, I had to, I got to pay tax. Imagine it's tax time. You got to go borrow money from a bank to then pay the government. Right? They in rough shape. So Nehemiah looking at it like, sheesh, man, and y'all in debt. So y'all got to pay them back and some. And so he thinking like, who did that? Oh, you getting loans from your brethren? Then he start getting off on the people like, how dare you? Because this is what the law said. Right? Keep going. If you lend money to any of my people that is poor by thee, you shall not be to him as a usurer, neither shall thou lay upon him usury. Right? The law told us, do not lend to them with usury. So now if we jump back to Nehemiah, that's why he uses that word specifically. He said, man, you charging the people usury? These people are poor. They sitting there, they borrowing money to pay taxes. They borrowing money just for food. These are poor people. Read it again what Nehemiah said. Also, I said, it is not good that you do what you do. Are you not walk? Wait, my bad. Hold on. And I said unto them, we after the ability have redeemed our brethren, the Jews, which were sold unto the heathen. And will you even sell your brethren? Or shall they be sold unto us? Then held their peace and found nothing to answer. And I said, it is not good that ye do 
Art ye not walk in the fear of our God because of the reproach of the heathen, our enemies? I likewise, and my brethren and my servants, might exact of them money and corn. I pray you, let us leave off this usury. Restore, I pray you, to them, even this day, their lands, their vineyards, their oliveyards, and their houses, also to also the hundredth part of the money and of the corn and the wine and the oil that ye exact of them. Right? So they were charging them a hundredth part. Right? A hundredth part. So if they broke down whatever they got into a hundred pieces, they wanted one piece. In other words, they are charging them one percent. Right? Everything they give, well, give me a percent of that. You know what I'm saying? No, no, no. Go ahead and get that back. You know what I'm saying? I need that back. Thank you. Much appreciated. You know what I'm saying? They were making money off of these boys, but they kept needing money. So they over here, they, they making a profit. He said, nah, give them back everything you took from them. How'd that happen? Uh, they are like, get that back. You know what I'm saying? Get them back everything, everything you took from them. In including the hundred part. He looking, I heard about what they, including the darn hundred part, you greedy butts. You shouldn't be doing it to your people. All right, keep going. Then said they, we will restore them and will require nothing of them. So we will do as thou sayest. Then I called the priest and took an oath of them that they should do according to this promise. Also, I shook my lap and said, so God shake out every man from his house and from his labor that performs not this promise. Even thus be he shaken out and empty. And all the congregation said, amen, and praised Yahuwah that the people did according to this promise. Moreover, from the time that I was appointed to be their governor in the land of Judah, from the 20th year, even unto the two and 30th year of Artaxerxes the king, that it was that is 12 years, I and my brethren have not eaten the bread of the governor. But the former governors that had been before me were chargeable unto the people and had taken of them bread and wine besides 40 shekels of silver. Yea, even their servants bear rule over the people. But so did so. But so did not I because of the fear of God. Right. So he's telling them he looking like I know the people in bad condition. I know a lot of these people out here in our land are poor. They doing bad. Right. He looking like. But I need y'all to know. I didn't eat none of it. So it's like as the governor, he's he's positioned as the governor, right? So he was given control. So as the governor, he it comes with certain perks, right? He he got some uh, some authority and he got certain perks, right? He's not just a regular guy that pulled up. He was made the governor over Judah, right? Almost like like the sub king, right? He's made the person that's in charge. Right. Like a governor, same way we think of a governor. Right. So he's in charge over G Judah. But he's saying, I didn't eat the governor's wine. I mean, the governor's bread. Right. I didn't eat the governor's uh, wine. So these are things that were allotted to him that he didn't even take. He like give it to the people. And the reason why he's like, because the governors that came before me, them boys was scam artists. And they lord over the people. In other words, you know, what I'm saying they boss the people around, you know, what I'm saying try to make the people serve them. He is like, nah, I'm not doing that. So he's saying, I want y'all to know this is different. Watch what he say after that. Yea, also, I continued in the work of this wall. Neither bought we any land. And all my servants were gathered here unto the work. Moreover, there were at my table 150 other Jews and rulers, besides those that came unto us from among the heathen that are about us. Now that which was prepared for me daily was one ox and six choice sheep. Also, fowls were prepared for me, and once and once in ten days store of all sorts of wine. Yet for all this required not I the bread of the governor, because the bondage was heavy upon this people. Think upon me, my God, for good according to all that I have done for this people. Right? So Nehemiah, he's explaining to he's explaining to the people in this book, he's looking like, Man, look, I didn't partake in none of this extra stuff. I wasn't taking nothing from the people. I didn't ask nobody for nothing. The people that came and worked on the gate with me were my servants. Right. So another he's saying I'm not chargeable to nobody. In other words, I don't owe anybody anything. I came here and I spent my own money, my own resources and the king's resources to get this thing done. Right. Everything I'm doing, I'm not taking nothing from the people. Right. And then at the very end of it, he said, yeah, remember me. 
remember me. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, be my witness that I'm not out here trying to scam nothing. The people before me did that. Now, this is the thing. It is his right to take some of those things. As a governor, it's well within his right. He can eat the governor's bread, the governor's wine, the lamb and the, and the, and the food that's prepared for him every day. He said six, was it six lambs? Mm, he said uh, one, one ox, six choice sheep, and also fowls were prepared for me. Right? Six choice sheep, right, and fowls were prepared for him. And an ox. Right? So this is, this is what, at, at any point, he can be like, mm, kill that sheep. That's what I want to eat tonight. Go ahead and cook that ox for me. That's a, that's a big one. I like her. That's a big one. Go ahead and chop her up. You know what I'm saying? Let's eat tonight. Right? At any point, he could just point him out. That was fully within his right. He wouldn't be evil for doing that. But he had to set himself apart from all the liars. Right? He had to set himself apart. That's just like all these pastors that get up and collect money from the people and don't teach them a thing. So now a man of God comes, man, I don't, I don't want no money from nobody. I ain't asked nobody for nothing. I will do it. Don't even worry about it. Because guess what? Y'all not about to lump me with these liars. And that's how Nehemiah thinking. You can't lump me with the previous governors that were before me. They used to scam y'all. They used to take y'all bread. They used to make y'all work for them like servants. That's not how we not doing that. Y'all not about to put that evil on me. What we about to do is we about to get this wall built and we going to get Jerusalem back together. Everybody need to keep the law. Right? Keep going. Watch this. What chapter is this? Five, six? six. It's chapter six, verse one. Watch what the book say. Now it came to pass when Sambalat and Tobiah and Gershom the Arabian and the rest of our enemies heard that I built the wall and that there was no breach left therein, though at that time I had not set up the doors upon the gates, that Sambalat and Gershom sent... So when he say no the breach therein, he's saying that the whole wall at this point is connected. And not only before it was connected, but, you know, it had little parts that needed some work. So now they got the work done. It's now connected all the way and there's no holes in it. But he haven't put the doors on there yet. You know what I'm saying? So them doors, them doors, you know what I'm saying? So it's still some work to do. But he got the whole thing connected. Ain't no holes in it, no breaches, no breaks. He just needs some doors. That's all we need, some doors. Let's see. Keep going. And Sambalot and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in some one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. And I sent messages unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Right. Nope. So they tried to set my mans up. They sent some messenger. They're like, yo, Nehemiah, man, heard about what you're doing out there, man. Peace to you. Peace to you. I tell you what, why don't you come meet with us? You know what I'm saying? Come on down yonder. You know what I'm saying? Come meet with us. We can hang out a little bit. You know what I'm saying? You just want to chop it up with you. You want to have a conversation with you. Right. But Nehemiah knew. He was like, man, these boys trying to set me up. I ain't crazy. So he said, listen, I got work to do. Can you explain to me why it would be important for me to stop doing the work to come relax with y'all? Let's see. Keep going. Yet they sent unto me four times after this sort, and I answered them after the same manner. Then sent Sambalot his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, wherein it was written, it is reported among the heathen, and Gashmu said that, that you and the Jews seek to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words? And thou hast also appointed prophets to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah, and now shall it be reported to the king according to these words. Now therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then right, I so now they're talking about our prophets that are prophesying about Yahushua, right? So the prophets that prophesy about Yahushua saying Yahushua going to be king, they're using that against Nehemiah. Does that sound familiar? Right? So they using that against Nehemiah and they saying the king, I mean, the prophets are talking about 
there's going to be a king in Judah. And that violates the law of the actual king. Y'all can't have a king. Do y'all think to rebel? Are y'all building this wall so y'all can rebel against the king? Remember, we got a bad rap with the kings. Remember, one of the previous kings was like, no, nah, they got to stop building because this is an insurrectionist people. So they keep trying to put that tag on us to make the king worried about us. But, you know, the king is with Nehemiah. But they're trying to make the king worry about us, right? So they looking like, man, y'all building the walls so that y'all can, uh, you know what I mean? Y'all can, y'all can rebel again. You know what I'm saying? I heard one of the prophets talking about it. it's a king in Judah. You know that's against the rules now, boy, right? So they're trying to set us up. Keep going. Then I sent unto him, saying, "There are no such things done as thou sayest, but you faint them out of thine own heart." For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it be not done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Afterward, I came unto the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Mahitabiel, who was shut up. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us shut the doors of the temple. For they will come to slay thee. Yea, in the night will they come to slay thee. And I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there that being as I am will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. And lo, I perceived that God had not sent them, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me. But Tobiah and Sambalot had hired him. Therefore was he hired that I should be afraid and to do so in sin, and that they might have matter to of an, for an evil report that they might reproach me. My right? God. So again. This sounds familiar. It's exactly the type of stuff that they try to do to do with Yahushua. Remember, Yahushua made a prophecy and he said in three days, you know what I'm saying, this temple will be destroyed and rebuilt. And they use that against him to say, oh, he said he's going to destroy the temple. Right. And in the same way, the Gentiles is trying to set Nehemiah. Up. First, they came to him like, oh, man, I heard I heard, you know, I heard y'all got a king. I know that's against the rules now. You know what I'm saying? Trying to scare him from doing the work. Right. Then after that, they came back to him and they used his own people and his own people said, look, man, I'm telling you, they might try to come and get you. I think I heard they after you. You might want to go hide out in the temple. That's against our law. He can't walk in the temple. So then he's looking at it like, oh, you think because I'm governor and I run the show that I think I get away with this. No. Do I look like somebody that'll flee? In other words, do I look like somebody that's, that's going to run and hide? Like, no, we good. You know what I'm saying? But he knew they were just trying to do that to set him up so that they could say, oh, look, Nehemiah, he went to the temple and that's unlawful. Yo, what y'all going to do about that? Then they can discredit him, right? Keep going. My God, think thou upon Tobiah and Sambalot according to these words, according to their works, and on the prophetess, no, Noadiah and the rest of the prophets that would have put me in fear. So the wall was finished in the 20 and fifth day of the month, Elu, in 50 and two days. And it came to pass that when all our enemies heard thereof and all the heathen that was about us saw these things, they were much cast down in their own eyes, for they perceived that this work was wrought of our God. Moreover, in those this days, this work was who? Wrought of our God. That's important to know. That's important to know. If we just spent a whole six chapters, right, reading about how Nehemiah and his servants put together this wall. Right. If we were to finish reading chapter three, go go back to chapter three. Give me verse five. This is Nehemiah chapter three, verse five. All right, watch who it say is building this wall. And next unto them, the Tekoa, the, the Tekoites repaired, but the nobles put not their necks to the work of their Lord. Moreover, the old gate repaired Jehoiada, the son of Pasiah, and Meshulam, the son of Besodiah. They laid the beams thereof and set up the doors thereof and the locks thereof and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Melatiah and Gibe the Gibeonite. And right, it's giving you names. 
of individuals and where they from. Jump on down to the last verse. It goes on to give you names of each individual that's helping out with this wall all throughout. And watch what the last verse say. And between the going up of the corner unto the sheep gate, repaired the goldsmiths and the merchants. Right? So it gave you a full chapter of all the individuals who were helping out with building this wall. However, jump on back to, to, to Nehemiah where we left off. What was it? Nehemiah 6 verse what? 16. 16. It's Nehemiah chapter 6 verse 16. We, we jump all the way back over here and Nehemiah says they knew that this thing was built by our God, that this was wrought, in other words, worked by our God. It is important that we understand the mindset of our ancient people. Christians have a problem with this right now, right? Christians will tell you, no, it's not of your works, right? But it's God's work. It's not your works. We can't do the works. It's nothing that we can do to make God love us any more or any less because they struggle with the concept of God getting the credit for your work. Right. They think they think humility is not working and saying, God, you do this for me. No, 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 no. Giving glory to God is you doing all the work, suffering, taking all the pain, carrying all the burden and then saying at the end of it, God did that. Right. You turning away from all sin and saying, you know what, I'm going to live the rest of my life without sin. And after you do that, you say, God did that. That comes with a true understanding of God. Not that not that you get to lay back and be like, oh, well, I know I'm a sinner and I'm always going to be a sinner, but I'm still saved. Because God does the work. No, that's a lie. That's a good sign that God ain't doing nothing with you. Right? When the work is being done and we put our blood, sweat, and tears into the work and it's done according to his purpose, God did that work. No different from when, when, when Biden sent up the missiles to block the drones from Iran or when Biden send the, 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 the stuff over to uh, Ukraine, we say Biden did it. But in reality, there's a whole bunch of soldiers and military officers and admin officials that's putting together these orders and packaging up this stuff. And they put it on one plane and then a bunch of guys load it off of the plane and they sign the stuff, make sure they got it. And they train them on how to use it. Those are a bunch of individuals that actually did that. But guess who gets the credit? Biden did that. We understand that concept everywhere except Christianity. And that's what got our people confused. You have to do the work. Your butt can't sit around and wait for God to move something and do something. No, God don't have to move another thing. Do you know how much moving he did? He did? gave us all the darn instruction. After that, sent his son. The son died for us. And then he gave us all the rest of the instruction. He made it clear for us told us everything we need to do, and we still sitting around waiting for, oh, I'm just waiting. I mean, I hear what you're saying, brother, but, I mean, I'm just going to pray on it. What you going to pray on when the book said? If the man told you in the book, who are you praying to? Let me see. This is the answer to my question, but, but God, do you mind answering my question? That don't make no sense. Pray to God about something that's in this book and then turn around and say you believe his book. Oh, no, I believe the book. I, I believe every inch of the Bible. You know, you know, if they say Bible, if they don't say Bible, they don't say, they say Bible, you know, they but ain't never read. It. Team darn pronounce it. I read every inch. Oh, I know the Bible front to back. Front to back, I know this Bible. As soon as you hear somebody say, I know the Bible front to back, they don't know nothing about it. They ain't never read it. They ain't never picked it up. They probably read a song. It was on tattooed on somebody's arm. People make a darn mess. But Nehemiah has the proper mindset. After he put in the blood, sweat, and equity, after he staying up late nights watching for these people, after he directed the people to say, you know what, put this sword out. He said, look, the work is done. And when these people look at it, they know God did it. 
That's humility. To understand and know I can't do the only way I'm able to do this is because God set forth a way. He would have stopped me. He would have let these people attack me if he didn't want this to happen. At any point, the most High God would have let these people break in and attack me. He would have told the king, don't give him the materials if he didn't want this to happen. But Nehemiah is looking at it like, man, all this stuff is coming together. It's hard. It's rough. It's scary. I got to keep the people going. But it's all coming together. You know what? God did this. Keep going. This is, uh, ex I mean, uh, Nehemiah chapter 6, verse what? 17, 16? 17. Moreover, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters unto Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came unto them. For there were many in Judah sworn unto him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Arah, and his son, Yohanan, had taken the daughter of Meshullam, the son of Berechiah. Also, they reported his good deeds before me and uttered my words to him. And Tobiah sent letters to put me in fear. Now it came to pass when the wall was built and I had set up the doors and the pet and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed that I gave my brother Hananiah and Hananiah, the ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. And I said unto them, that not the gates of Jerusalem be open until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watchers of the inhabitants of Jerusalem, everyone in his watch and everyone to be over against his house. Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein and the houses were not built. And my God put it in my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them, which came up at the first and found written therein. These are the children. Right, so you remember the genealogy that they were putting together in Ezra. So he's saying, I found the record of the genealogy. Because remember, they were checking people like, hey, who's your daddy? And who's his daddy? So they would they was making sure people was, you know, what I'm saying legit. So they made a record of that genealogy. And ne of Nehemiah, he stumbled on like, oh, this is what they built all them years ago. Because remember, years and years have passed since the beginning of what we read in Ezra. You know what I'm saying? To the time that actual like, so Ezra, years and years passed from Ezra 1 to Ezra 7. Right? He's about a little after what's happening in Ezra 7. After Ezra actually got there in Ezra 7, he's a little after that. Ezra 1 through 7 or 1 through 6 maybe. You know what I'm saying? That was explaining all the stuff that happened before Ezra got there. Right? Then Ezra ends up showing up. So he's around in that same time. So he's looking. He's like, oh, well, I found the genealogy of everybody who came up here in the first place. Who came back in the first place. Watch this. And these are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those that had been carried away from whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried away came again to Jerusalem and to Judah, everyone unto his city, who came with Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel Yahushua, Nehemiah, Azariah, Ramaiah, Nehemani, Mordecai, Bilshan. Go ahead and jump to the next chapter. So he go through all the names of the people that came. Right? You see it start off with Zerubbabel and Joshua. Right? Joshua being the high priest. Zerubbabel was the governor. Right? So Zerubbabel had the same position that Nehemiah now occupies. Mordecai from Esther was with him too. And all the people gathered themselves together as one of them, one man into the street that was before the water gate. And they spake unto Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, which Yahuwah had commanded to Israel. And Ezra the priest brought the law before the congregation, both of men and women, and all that could hear with understanding upon the first day of the seventh month. And he read right, that. So on the first day of the seventh month, which day is that for us? That's the day of trumpets, right? That's a set apart day for us, right? That's the day of trumpets, a sacred assembly. It's a feast of, 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 of blowing other trumpets, right? So on the first day of the seventh month, then Ezra, this is the same Ezra from the book of Ezra, he came and he started to teach people the law. Because remember, Ezra was a priest. 
So he put it together and he started to teach people the law. Everybody who can hear and who can understand. Watch this. Upon the first day of the seventh month, and he read therein before the street that was before the water gate from the morning until midday, before the men and the women and those that could understand and the ears of all the people were attentive unto the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood up on the pulpit of wood, which they had made for the purpose to, and beside him stood Madaniah, oh, Mada, Madahiah, and Shema, and Ananiah, I mean, and Aniah, and Uriah, and Hilkiah, and, Mas, and Messiah on his right hand, and on his left hand, Pedaiah, and Mishael, and Malachiah, and Hushim, and Hashbanah, Zechariah, and Meshulam. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of the people. For he was he above opened the, the book people. in the sight of the people. Watch this. When he opened it, all the people stood up. And Ezra blessed you. All the people did what? Stood up. So when he was reading, they would, look, they were sitting down. It's the opposite of what we, go, what we do today, right? We go to church, you know what I'm saying? And then we sit down. They be having a standing when they doing what? Dang it. They get to look. When they sing it, everybody stand up. They make, look, they'll make your butt stand up. Be like, man, come on, I just got here. You know what I'm Come on. No, everybody stand up. Praise and worship. You know what I'm saying? Stand on up. Then they guilt you in the stand up. Your butt still, because I'll be sitting down. I'm like, man, I ain't but there. You know what I'm saying? Then the lady, you know what I'm saying? It's always the lady. Lady sitting there, she's singing around. And I don't know what y'all came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. Woo! I don't know what y'all came to do. And then she looked right at me every time. She always. She always looked right at me. And I don't know what you came to do, but I came to praise the Lord. So, you know me, I'm stubborn. I just look away. Be like, mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I'm tired. You know what I'm saying? Everybody else standing around me. He said, I'll tell you what. I don't know. Maybe God ain't moving for y'all the way he moved for me. But in what he did in my life, oh, it ain't nothing for me to stand for God. Ain't no way I'll be sitting down in church. And knowing everything the most I got to me, I mean, maybe he ain't doing nothing for you, but the way the Lord moving my life. <laughs> and so now I'm guilt like he moving my life too. You know what I'm saying? All right, let me go ahead and stand up. Now I get guilty in the standing up just to show that he be moving in my life. Call myself darn clapping and stuff. But you can't just clap. If you just clap like this, she going to keep guilting you. So now you got to clap and, you know what I'm saying? Oh, I don't know what. Now I find my devil sitting. Now I'm praising the Lord just like the rest of these darn Christians. Right? That's how they darn get you. So you look at it. We stand up today when the song is being played. But when do we sit down? As soon as the pastor come, pastor do this. Look, this is what the pastor do. He did a, uh, everybody thank uh, Sister Cheryl. Leading us in a very jubilant praise and worship. Um, go, on, go on, sit down. down. Turning your neighbor, say, we're going to hear a word today. <laughs> I want everybody to turn to, first of all, God is good. All the time, all the time. Everybody turn to Second Chronicle, chapter 33. Verse 8. You know, they always dramatic, just super dramatic when it chapter 33, uh, verse 8. And it says, I will not again make the feet of the Israelites leave the land I assigned your ancestors. Oh. <laughs> And that's all you gonna hear out of the word. He about to freaking Z that thing. Let me tell you something. <laughs> he walks slow because he old. You know what I'm saying? Let me tell you something. Church, and he got the he got the little thing. He wiped his face. The Lord has placed your the feet of your ancestors on holy ground. It's the holy ground of your finances or the holy ground of your relationships. Or the holy ground. And then he started freaking Zing that day. It's like, wait a minute, I read that chapter. He ain't talking about no darn finances or relationships or what where are you getting this stuff? But he flip it and he make it personal to whatever he think your butt is going. Cause you know us, we black people, we broke in the land. So all we always think about is money. As soon as you say, uh, 
the feet of your ancestors were placed. But the most high God, he said that he won't cause your feet to leave the place of your ancestors. But some of y'all, because you faithful and you you stood strong on the on the place of your ancestors, knowing that one day the sand beneath your feet. Right. He, he just start creating this whole image. That ain't got nothing to do with it. He just read. But you it sound dope. you be looking like I'm standing in it right now, Pastor. Then he started getting on the other people and start guilting you. He said, but others, your feet was on the place of your ancestors, but you huh, walked off. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know how they do it? Huh, but you, huh, you took a step off because you saw something coming. The Lord is looking for somebody who won't take a step off, who will stand where he placed his feet. And he do all that. So everybody excited like, I be standing, Lord. I be right here the whole time. He talking about me. My blessing is coming, Lord. Right? Now when the lady start running across the darn church and going around in circles and doing all that stuff, and you look at that stuff, get you excited. You look at that. I be wondering, like, do they pay some of them? Because if I, look, if I ran the church and I was a sinner, I'm definitely paying two old ladies. Like, look, I give you 150 today and another 150 next week. All I need you to do is just. You know what I'm saying? When you, when you, you know what I'm saying? When I, when the veins start popping out right here, just stand up, start running around in circles. That, that's all you got to do. Give me two laps. Two laps. It's going to get the people going, I promise you. 150 today, another 150 tomorrow. Okay, and you can wear a white dress on Sunday, okay? You know what I'm saying? Like, all right, we'll get it done. I give you two communions. You know what I'm saying? Like, you can get two crackers. You know what I'm saying? You got to cut deals with these people. Because I be wondering, be like, that thing is like clockwork. And it'd be different ones every time. So they'd be on rotation. You know what I'm saying? You in a big church, they'd be on rotation. Like, okay, this one. But that's what, you know what I'm saying? That's how that thing works. Right? So our mindset has to be the way that our ancestors were. The pastor tell you to sit down when the word, when he so-called about to preach the word. But notice what happened when Ezra opened the book. When he opened the book, they was already sitting. So through praise and worship and all that, they were sitting down. Yeah, lady, if you watching, I was right to be sitting down. Trying to get me in the dark standing up. You know what I'm talking about? Right? They were sitting down. And then when the word got preached, that's when all the people stood up. Watch what happened after that. Keep going. And when he opened it, all the people stood up and Ezra blessed Yahuwah, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. Amen. With lifting up their hands and they bowed their heads and worshiped Yahuwah with their faces to the ground. Yahushua and Benai and Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabethai, Hodijah, Messiah, Kalida, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, and the Levites caused the people to understand the law. And the people stood in their place. So they read the book of the law of God distinctly and gave the sense and and gave the sense and caused them to understand the reading. And Nehemiah, which is which is the Tirsh, Tirshatha, and Ezra the priest, the scribe, and the Levites that taught the people and said unto the people, This day is holy unto Yahuwah your God, more not nor weep. For all the people wept when they heard the words of the law. Then he said unto them, Go your way, eat the fat and drink the sweet, and send portions unto them for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy unto our Lord. Neither be sorry, for the joy of Yahuwah is your strength. So the Levites stilled all the people, saying, Hold your peace. For this day, for the day is holy. Neither be ye grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great myrrh, because they had understood the words that were declared unto them. And on the second day were gathered together the chief of the fathers of all the people, the priests, the Levites, unto Ezra the scribe, even to understand the words of the law. And they found written in the law which the Lord had commanded by Moses that the children of Israel should dwell in booths in the feast of the seventh month. And that day, and that they should publish and proclaim it in all their cities in Jerusalem, saying, Go forth into the mountain, fetch olive branches, and pine branches, and myrtle branches, and palm branches, and branches of thick trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went forth and brought them and made themselves booths, every one upon the roof of his house and in their courts. 
and in the courts of the house of God, and in the street of the water gate, and in the street of the gate of Ephraim, and on the con in the con all the congregations of them that came again out of the captivity made booths and set under the booths for since the day of Yah Jeshua the son of Nun unto that day had not the children of Israel done so, and there was very great gladness. Also day by day from the first day unto the last day he read in the book of the law of God and they kept the feast seven days on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to unto the men. Right. So they kept the feast of tabernacles next and they had read the law. So when they read the law, they heard, oh, in the feast of tabernacle, you supposed to dwell in tents. But what they did is they went out and they was like, OK, well, let's make tents. And they made it out of palm trees and a bunch of other stuff and put together a bunch of tents. And the people did it and they they, they made note of it. They're like, man, look, the people ain't kept the Feast of Tabernacles like this since the days of Joshua, son of Nun. You know what I'm saying? That's right after Moses. There's like the people ain't did it like this since right after Moses. Right. But they did it in the seventh month on the 15th day and they kept it all the way into the 20, 23rd day, was it? Oh, I, guess, I guess it would be the 22nd day. Right. So they kept the Feast of Booths or the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles. Is that the end of the chapter? Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll say the rest for next time. We'll finish Nehemiah off next week. Sister Pamela said, uh, oh, okay. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. So yeah, when they say, when the book say eat the fat, it's talking about eat the best, right? Fat mean, you know what I'm saying? Fat, you're going to see that throughout the scripture. Fat is usually referring to like the best parts. You know what I'm saying? So the best parts, a lot of times in our in our offering, we had to eat, we had to burn the best parts. All right. So the best part of the animal, we had we had burned it as a sacrifice or the burnt offering. Not a burnt offering, sorry, the peace offering. All right. So we're gonna learn those of us that's reading through the through the book. We in the book of Exodus right now. We're gonna we gonna start to learn the different types of sacrifices, right? A lot of people they don't, you know what I'm saying? These people that run their mouth talking about they know the law and all this stuff, they don't know this law. The way y'all about to learn the law, that y'all gonna really learn the law. You know what I'm saying? So it's a bunch of different types of sacrifices, right? So you have burnt offering. Generally with a burnt offering, you're going to burn it and you burn the whole thing, right? And for a burnt offering, you can get, you can have an ox, you can have a lamb, you can have a ram, right? All those could be burnt offerings. You burn the whole thing. Don't nobody get to eat nothing from it. But then you have peace offering. With a peace offering, you bring a peace offering and oftentimes you have a food offering that go with it or a gift offering that goes with it. So like for a peace offering, you could do, you know what I'm saying? You could do the same thing. You could do something, you could do something like from, from, from the herd, which would be like an ox, right? Or a cow or anything like that. You know what I'm saying? Or you could do something from the flock, right? Or you could have a peace offering. You know what I'm saying? Usually if you poor, you ain't got, you ain't got nothing from the herd or the flock. Then you could do a peace offering of turtle doves. You know what I'm saying? You could do the doves. You could do the birds. You know what I'm saying? But no matter what, with the peace offering, you burn only a portion. So that's usually when you burn in the fat, right? So you'll take the fat and you'll burn that. And then the rest of it, you split it between the priests, right? So the priest would take the breast and then the pri priest take the thigh, if I'm not mistaken. They take the breast and the thigh. Everything else, you get to take home and you eat, right? The priest keeps something. You get you burn something for, to the most high God, then you keep it. And then the meat offering is usually or not meat, but the food offering, right? It's called meat offering in the book. But remember, in the scripture, meat means food. You know what I'm saying? So you got you got the food offering. The food offering is gonna be, you know, usually some type of grain. So you're gonna have like unleavened bread or unleavened cakes or unleavened something. You take that and you split that with the with the priest. So you let the priest get some of it, and then you ate it, and the priest gotta eat it. Right there on the spot, you know, well, not right on the spot, but they got to eat it before, you know what I'm saying? They can't let it stay overnight. You know what I'm saying? If it stay overnight, they got to throw it away. Then they got to eat it right there in, in front of the temple or tabernacle, right? And what else you got? Then you got the sin offering and the trespass offering. You split that with the priest too, right? So every time somebody sin and you got to make an offering for it, that's how the priests eat, right? That's, that's their economy. That's their food. So people sin, you go and, you know what I'm saying, you share the food with them. So, you know, what I'm saying? different different types of offering. Um, anybody who's watching the study now and wasn't watching it all along, you go all the way back to the beginning. We discuss all these different types of offering and go into them in detail and, and break them down and everything. Um, I can't remember what study it is, but it's going to be one of the studies that we're talking about. Probably Leviticus. Any questions?
Yeah, those horses. Yeah, our people used to ride horses. Yeah, uh, uh, the Egyptians was riding horses. Serious. But but horses specifically. So one of our kings, uh, King Solomon, he uh he had, he you know what I'm saying he uh he our law told us that you couldn't multiply horses. Right? It was specifically in our law, he multiplied them things. He had a whole bunch of horses. He said his books say we can't multiply wives and we can't multiply horses. Right? Oh, yeah. so we can't just, just just get a whole bunch of wives, right? We can't just sit here and get a whole bunch of horses out. Do I got that right? Did it say multiply wives or maybe it's gold? Don't multiply horses. Don't multiply wives. It was uh, wives? I think he might have mentioned gold. He might have, but I know it was yeah, wives. Yeah, something about gold too. Yeah. Yeah, something, yeah. So it was, a, it was a couple of law. But yeah, just to answer your question, yes, our people did ride horses. It was definitely horses. Any other questions? All right. Well, let's pray out. I love y'all. Appreciate y'all. I'll see y'all on the Sabbath call, on the uh, fellowship call tomorrow, y'all willing. And uh, let me know if y'all got any questions other than that.